You all look awful pale. <laughs> On that, let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word. Lord, as we just heard that the Holy Spirit abides in us, so Lord, may your Spirit lead us just now as we delve into your word. We know that apart from your Spirit, we will never grasp the truth of your word. So we commit our time now to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn in your Bibles to uh, to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. We're finishing this section on God's wisdom, of godly wisdom, and um, that whole notion of God's wisdom has been so good to think about. Jeremiah 10, 12 says, by wisdom, God established the world. By wisdom, everywhere you look, everywhere you look, you see the wisdom of God, the moon's orbiting the earth, the sun orbiting the, the earth, orbiting the sun, the birds everywhere. Behold your God everywhere you look. And it's all a display of God's wisdom in his creation. Calvin called it that dazzling theater that we live in. And uh, as you think about wisdom... God's wisdom is going to be coming down to us as James is going to tell us. It's an amazing thing. Now, you probably have figured it out, but the world just doesn't get it when it comes to true godly wisdom. With no regard for God, no regard for his truth, they come up with all kinds of ways, millions of ways of explaining what life is all about, evolution, They fail to recognize that man is made in God's image, but he has fallen in sin. He's in need of redemption. He's in need of regeneration. So they come up with all kinds of psychological uh, theories about why we are the way we are, all apart from God's kind of wisdom. And that's where James is taking us This morning, the wisdom, if you look in verse 17, and I just like the first phrase, but the wisdom from above, this is the wisdom we're looking at. The wisest people are not people with the highest intelligence quotient or who are savvy to make the best financial investments or are brain surgeons, even though we greatly appreciate them and some of them know the Lord, praise God. The wisest men and women are moms and dads, men and women, oldsters, youngsters, who are diligently applying God's word into their lives, ministering that word to others. Jesus himself grew in wisdom Luke, two verses in Luke, Luke 2.40, this is just after Jesus is born. It says, the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom. And And the grace of God was upon, increasing in wisdom. What was he learning? He was learning the Old Testament. He was learning about God. He was learning about creation, about man being made in God's image, about marriage. He was learning about the fall. He was learning everything in the Old Testament. Remember, he was a man. He humbled himself. He laid aside his divine prerogatives. And then a little later on, you remember that uh, the family went down to Jerusalem and they left and Jesus wasn't there with them and they had to go back and there he was asking questions, talking in the temple there as a 12-year-old boy, and it says in Luke 2.52, and Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Jesus became like us, and he grew in learning the Old Testament, and we know that as he preaches Sermon on the Mount is the Old Testament, the truth 
of the Old Testament applied to life. So now, there is this clash of wisdom that I want to talk about before we get into these two verses in uh, James. James told us last time we were together here in James, and by the way, thanks to John Beal for an excellent message. I was glad to listen to that and hear it and see it, actually, uh, while we were in Florida. But James told us that the results of this world's wisdom in verse 16 is bitter jealousy, selfish ambition. And the rotten fruit of this kind of godless wisdom is disorder and every evil thing. That is moral and spiritual chaos. That's what you have when you have worldly wisdom. People have a hard time getting along with one another. Every broken relationship is really the result of this, the world's kind of wisdom. When did all this godless wisdom begin? Very briefly and quickly, though, I do want to bring this to you. Last week, I listened to Daryl and Virgil in their Just Thinking podcast, Three Hours, and I highly recommend it to you. They were talking about evangelical deconstruction. Evangelical deconstruction. That is, taking what we know about the Bible and attacking it, tearing it apart, questioning everything you thought you believed. But here's what I want to bring, you, bring to you. They pointed out, by the way, if you don't want to listen to the whole thing, go to one hour and 30 minutes and start in there. They'll give you five facts about evangelical de deconstructionism. It's very good. But here's what I want to point out to you that they pointed out. In Genesis 3, Satan was the first deconstructionist. He cast doubt on the word of God, and then he denied the word of God. In verse 1 of chapter 3 of Genesis, he questioned Eve, indeed, did God actually say that you should not eat of every tree of the garden? And then he flat out denied it. This is deconstructionism. He doubt and then denial. You surely will not die. And Eve looked at that fruit. It looked tasty. It was delightful to the eye. And it was able to make one wise. That's where I'm going with this. She saw it as something that would make her wise. Wisdom without obedience. Impossible. And ever since, the world has pursued its own earthly, natural, demonic wisdom. And Satan is at war with God's wisdom. He is seeking to blast godly wisdom right out of our hearts. He's got a double-barreled shotgun, doubt and deny. That is how he attacks the Word of God. Now, and by the way, uh, when you deny the Word of God, it does lead to death. And we're in this war. Now, I want to lay out for you these two kinds of wisdom, very briefly here, there, there's more than this, but let's just think together about the world's wisdom and God's wisdom. Worldly wisdom, godly wisdom. Worldly wisdom says, make up your own mind about what is right and wrong. Godly wisdom recognizes you were created to need God's counsel for living in God's world. World's, the world's wisdom says, we're here to enjoy ourselves, get as much personal satisfaction as possible, even at the expense of other people, even at the expense of a marriage or of a family. God's wisdom says the chief end of man is to know, please, and glorify God and enjoy him forever. I added a few words there. The world's wisdom says you need to love yourself and meet your own needs first. God's wisdom says you need to deny yourself and help meet the needs of others. The world's wisdom says you should follow your feelings, follow your heart, be your own person. We hear that constantly. God's wisdom says be truth-oriented, follow the truth even if it isn't easy. The world's wisdom says this life, this body, Matter is most important. In fact, if you're an evolutionist, that's all you've got is matter. 
take care of yourself. A commercial scream this. I mean, every commercial, you know, take this before you go to bed every night and you will lose 20 pounds in two days. And you'll look like the person on the commercial. God's wisdom says, prepare now for eternity. God's wisdom says, watch over your heart with all diligence. A truly wise person. I thought this, these are three truths about a truly wise person. A truly wise person thinks about his accountability to God. I hope you think about your accountability to God. A truly wise person thinks about the brevity of life. We have no guarantees for tomorrow. And a truly wise person thinks about eternity ahead. You're going to live somewhere forever. Are you prepared for that? A truly wise person is. So you see this clash of wisdom. You see it in the Psalms. Psalm 1. The, the blessed man, he does not uh, walk in the counsel of the ungodly, uh, stand in the way of sin, or sit, sit in the seat of the scornful. He refuses. He delights in the, in the word of God, in the law of the Lord. In Psalm 2, the worldly wise person, people say, let us tear off God's standards and law. God has no right to tell us how to live. We live for ourselves. We don't need or want a God or a Savior. We don't want this man to rule over us. That's worldly wisdom, Psalm 2. And I love the way that psalm ends in verse 12. God counsels, kiss the son, lest he become angry and you perish in the way. This is God's wisdom that has the final say and conquers all worldly wisdom. So we have this clash of wisdoms, worldly wisdom, godly wisdom. Now, we come to verse 17 of James 3, the character of godly wisdom. And just the way James says this is so perfect. But the wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. It's from above. The wisdom that we need does not come out of a depraved, corrupt heart. It comes from God. It isn't our own wisdom. It comes down from God himself through Jesus Christ alone. God's kind of wisdom that comes down from above is God-centered, it's God-focused, it's God-glorifying, it's Bible-directed, it's Christ-honoring. It only comes to a person through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's wisdom incarnate. So we have the wisdom from above that comes down, Christ himself, who is the wisdom of God. And then along with that is the whole revelation of God. It is God's true truth. It doesn't come from the corrupted heart of the smartest of men. Remember Carl Sagan? I think he died some time ago. He said this. The cosmos is all that is, ever was, or ever will be. Godly wisdom or worldly wisdom. That's worldly wisdom. Most people would agree. It's all there is. So now, James, I mean, yeah, James lays out eight qualities of godly wisdom. And lay these beside your life. You're gonna, it's, they're gonna point out to you that. You and I need Christ because we all fall way short of these eight qualities. Now, I'm going to just think about them as a beautiful necklace on a lady and eight jewels hanging from this beautiful necklace because they are beautiful. 
They're what the millennial kingdom will be all about. When Christ, the Prince of Peace, rules and peace covers the whole world, there will be sinners in it. That's a whole other story. But So let's look at these. First of all, well, before we go any further, you, you must have God's life in your heart to grow truly wise fruit. This fits so well with Manny's uh, Sunday school lesson this morning on discipleship and the love. Because you could almost replace wisdom with love and be the same thing. But you must have God's, lo- God's life in your heart in order to bear the fruit of wisdom. Christ alone gives us what we need to turn us from fools, which were born fools, to wise people. From people that are so subject to bitterness and jealousy, selfish ambition, into people who make God's wisdom the treasure and the pursuit of their life. That requires a circumcised heart. That requires regenerated heart, the life of God within. So these spiritual qualities serve as markers for Christian growth and discipleship. If you're a young man or a young lady, you should be thinking, am I embodying these? Am I living these out? Is that person I'm interested in living these out? First of all, first jewel, pure. And notice how James says this. But the wisdom from above is first pure. First pure. Before the rest, it is first pure. That is very important. If you leave that out, you've left out truth. God's wisdom is pure. That is... It's spiritually and morally pure, but it's much more than that. God's wisdom is pure, that is, it is undivided. Just like Deuteronomy 6, the Lord our God is one God. That's why we love him with all of our heart, not a little love for that God and a little love for that God and a little love for that. No, here God's wisdom is pure, undivided. When an Israelite brought a sacrifice to the temple, it had to be without spot or defect, right? Pure. Purity means an undivided heart in devotion to God. Think about Daniel. So illustrates this so well. He was a he was had an undivided heart, a completely devoted heart to the Lord. Now, if you don't start with purity here, you don't have God's wisdom. It's kind of the opposite of that double-minded man in James 1. A man who wants to go both ways. A man who is looking both ways. He's got one foot in one canoe and the other foot in the other canoe. And he thinks he's going to make it and he's in for a big fall. You have to have this purity, this single-minded devotion to Jesus Christ. That's the essence of purity. Now... That doesn't mean you are sinless as a Christian. No, no, you're fighting sin. You're at war with sin. You're not excusing it. You're not coddling it. You're not hiding it. Wisdom walks in God's light. You're warring against sin. You're warring against sinful lusts and selfishness. But you are committed to Jesus Christ and living for his glory. 1 John 3 3 says, He who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he, Christ, is pure. Pure. Now, wisdom, part of purity here, wisdom always comes down on God's side. Take that with you if you don't take anything else. Wisdom, godly wisdom, always comes down on God's side. You'll love and you'll be concerned about people who are walking contrary to God's truth. But you'll always come down on God's side. We recently heard about a pundit that 
says some good things, but he has a homosexual partner, and they're having twins together. Now, you know the two of them aren't having twins together because two men don't make babies. No, they're using two women to make these babies for them so that these poor babies will be raised without their mother who are going to carry some of those babies with them for the mo most of the rest of their life, as I understand it. Now, may these two guys come to understand the error of their ways and how anti-God this lifestyle is. This is wrong. And as a believer, we love these people, but we can't affirm them. You can't congratulate them when these two babies finally come into their, I can't call them a husband or I can't call it a marriage. It's not a marriage. It's a relationship. Purity always comes down on God's side. We pray for people in rebellion against God's ways, but we can't ally with them. And we're going to be pressured more and more to compromise purity for the sake of peace. God's wisdom will never compromise purity to promote peace. Remember that. God's wisdom will never compromise purity to promote peace. Godly wisdom is, first of all, first of all, and most importantly, pure. In Matthew 5, 7, Christ said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, sin clouds our vision. We can't see God working in our lives when we're messing around with sin. The pure in heart see God at work in their lives. So this wisdom that comes from above, it comes from God, is first of all pure, and immediately James is signaling to you and me, we need a pure Savior, undefiled, separated from sinners. We all need Jesus, because none of us are absolutely pure. So that's the gospel right there. Second gem, Peaceable. The man or woman who is developing godly wisdom works hard to be a peaceable person, a person who isn't demanding, controlling. He doesn't take offense personally. He's quick to be reconciled. He isn't out just to win an argument. He doesn't get on his high horse. Remember David when Nabal, the fool, uh, messed didn't give David's men what they needed out there on the, in the wilderness. So David strapped on his sword, and he got 400 of his soldiers to gallop up to Nabal's estate. <laughs> and they were going to do Nabal in, that fool. But before they got there, a wise, peaceable lady by the name of Abigail came out and diffused David's anger. That's what godly wisdom does. It's peaceable. Grace pacifies an angry temper even when others treat you badly. Sometimes God will let people treat you badly just to help you to grow in being peaceable. God's involved in everything that happens in your life. Third, gentle. Gentle. Godly wisdom is gentle. You're not retaliating. You're not arguing. You're not insisting you're right. And look, you and I as believers can afford to be gentle. We don't have to argue and get pushy and shovey. Now, we know that Christ arose from the dead. We know that grave is empty, that tomb is empty, right? We know that the city of Nineveh fell. We know God's truth. 
We know the flood marred the surface of the planet. We know God created male and female. We know these things with God's wisdom, God's truth. So we don't have to get huffy and push, pushy and harsh with people. That's not godly wisdom. Think about Christ. He was gentle, he said. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you for, you, for I am gentle, humble in heart. He walked through men's plots to kill him. They cursed him. They mocked him. They spit on him. He was gentle or meek beyond imagination. That's one of the most amazing things when you read the story of the Gospels. The self-restraint of Christ to the sins that were committed against him. He endured injury without retaliating and without resentment. That's godly wisdom. He even said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Gentleness. I may have shared this story with you before, but if I did, it's a good story, so we'll tell it again. Kids can push your buttons, right, Dad? Unless you're awfully different than I am. Kids can push your buttons. My all-time favorite professor, Dr. Edward Panosian. His ancestry was in Armenia, so he was an Armenian, not an Arminian, an Armenian. Quite a history. He tells about it. But uh, Dr. Panosian tells about his youth when he was six or seven years old. He stole some coins from his mother's purse so that he could buy some penny candy on his way to school. He found out that he could make friends by giving them candy. So he stole the pennies to buy the penny candy to take to school. Well, his mom found out about it, and she scolded him. And she assured him that father would find out. Edward dreaded the coming judgment. One evening, when mom and the rest of the siblings went over to visit somebody else, it was just Edward and his father in the house. His father worked with wood, so he had some pieces of wood downstairs. So Edward's dad said, Edward, go get a piece of wood about this long and a couple inches wide and bring it up here. Edward had no clue what was going on. So he went down there into the basement and got a perfect piece of wood, brought it up. Dad said, Edward, let's, let's go up to the bedroom. So they got up to the bedroom and instead, instead of lashing poor Edward in his anger, Mr. Panosian did something else. And Dr. Panosian tells this story with tears. His father got down on his knees by his bed, and he ordered Edward to hit him with the stick as hard as he could across his back. Again, harder. I don't know how many times Edward hit his father with that piece of wood. But then his dad said, sit here, my son. What you just did to me didn't hurt me nearly as much as how you hurt me when I heard what you had done. Father looked at son and said, don't ever steal again. And he never did. Sometimes the biggest lessons come from the gentleness of wisdom. Now, kids, don't get any crazy ideas and tell your dad to do what Dr. Panosian's dad did. It's not going to happen, okay? Just forget about it. Good. Fourth jewel hanging from that beautiful necklace is reasonable. Peter was willing to change his mind when Paul confronted him in Galatians. You remember that? You're out of line, Peter. Peter reasonably changed his mind. You're willing to listen to opposing opinions. And if you see that you've been wrong, 
you're ready to change your mind. We got to be that way. Godly wisdom is not pig headed, it's not stubborn, reasonable. Fifth, full of mercy. Full of mercy. Joseph was ready to grant mercy to his brothers, even though he could have strung them all up. They all betrayed him, but he had treated them with mercy, full of mercy. Remember the dude who owed the Lord so many millions of dollars, and he went in there and he begged for mercy, please, for, I can't pay it. And the Lord said, I forgive you of it all. And then he went out and he grabbed the first guy that owed him a couple of bucks around the neck and ch choked him. Didn't kill him, but he choked him. He Pay up! Who showed mercy here? The good Samaritan felt compassion on that poor fellow all beat up along the road. Mercy. Full of mercy. Meeting people's needs, especially when they are in some kind of misery. Mercy meets misery. Full of mercy. What about Jacob's two sons? Simeon and Levi. Remember those guys? Cold-blooded murderers who schemed against the Shechemites and slew them all because of Dinah. What kind of mercy was that? Now, that's us when we refuse to forgive and when we hold grudges. Just think about those two Israelites slaying the Shechemites. That's us walking in the burnt out landscape of godless worldly wisdom. Now, and I want you to see there in that fifth one, and it, it, it also includes the, the next one as well, but full of mercy. Full of mercy. Not just mercy, but lots of it. When godly wisdom is ruling your heart, you remember how Christ flooded you with mercy. He was rich in mercy. Rich. Full of mercy. He poured out mercy on you. Godly wisdom practices mercy to people who don't deserve your mercy any more than you deserve mercy. God's mercy, right? Are you quick to forgive those who offend you? I recently heard R.C. Sproul, you may have heard this, I kind of check out the uh, Renewing Your Mind talks every day. This was a couple of weeks ago. R.C. was talking about forgiveness, and he talks about how he was in a church, and I think he was pastoring the church, if I remember correctly, and he offended a lady in the church, clearly. He knew it. She knew it. And he went to this lady, and he confessed his offense against her, and he asked her to forgive him. She refused. According to the story, she never did. As I recall, he even met up with her on a mission field somewhere. She still held that grudge against him. Full of mercy. That's godly wisdom. Whether it's your spouse or your enemy. Full of godly, uh, godly mercy. Godly wisdom. Okay, number six, full of good fruits. Full of mercy and good fruits. Proverbs 11 says... Verse 11, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. You're a tree of wisdom, and you're producing not just a little, not just some, but your life is full of refreshing, encouraging, helpful fruit for others. You feed others, not your anger or irritations, but refreshing, encouraging fruit. And then, very quickly here, impartial, seventh jewel, impartial. What does that mean? God, godly wisdom doesn't make judgment based on human differences. Don't preach that, Pastor, because that's going to offend that one guy, and you know how much money he puts in the offering. Impartial. 
Son, God has given you a good mind. I think you could do better than that. Versus, son, do you realize when your brother was your age, he was pulling A's, and look at you, you're pulling D's. What's up with you? That's partiality, right? Dads can easily do that. Maybe even moms. Sincere. Last one. Unhypocritical. I think some of the versions even translate it that way, which is what it is. It's unhypocritical. A hypocrite is somebody who is an actor speaking under a mask, literally. So, so sincerity means being real, being honest, admitting your needs, your weaknesses. You're not putting on a Christian show. You're not saying nice things to people, and then behind their back, you're slandering them. Romans 12, 9 says, let love be without hypocrisy. And remember, hypocrisy was the leading sin of the Pharisees. They were hypocrites. Remember? That's what Jesus called them. Hypocrites. We don't want Jesus to call us hypocrites. Be real. Be genuine. And then verse 18, the call of godly wisdom and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Righteousness is required for peace. To be a peacemaker, to do all you can without compromising the purity of truth to bring peace into your relationships. Romans 12, 18 is so good. You should memorize it. As much as is possible, so much as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. As much as is possible. It may not always be possible, but as much as is possible. So these are the eight character qualities and the call of godly wisdom. Aim for these. Review them often. Dads, moms, kids, believers of all sorts. Let me just challenge you with this. Are your motives pure? Seeking first God's kingdom rather than playing games with sin. Do you pursue peace or argue about the slightest thing that comes up? Are you gentle with others, with your family, especially with people you oppose or oppose you or contradict you? Are you reasonable or bullheaded? Are you willing to change your mind when you know you've been wrong? You're right, I was wrong. Are you full of mercy toward others, quick to forgive them? Quick to seek forgiveness when you've offended someone? Is your life like a fruit tree? As you go through life, people are eating the fruit of your life. You're bringing encouragement and joy to them. Are you free of partiality? Or do you only hang, on, hang with your own kind? Are you involved, the fruit? Are you involved in sharing the gospel or at least bringing Christ into your conversations? Do that. It's the fruit, the fruit of wisdom. Are you real? Are you the same at home, at church, at work, in your leisure time? Or do you compromise your standards depending on whom you are with, or depending on with whom you are. Did I get that right, Marilyn? Thank you. Thank you. And are you sowing the seed of God's truth into other people's lives? This is God's kind of wisdom, all found only in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who came and died on that cross for us sinners who are full of worldly wisdom, who need regeneration, who need the Spirit of God to take the Word of God and to cleanse our hearts so that we can produce this godly wisdom. Father, we thank you for your truth. Lord, flood our hearts with your grace that we might bear this fruit, the grace of Christ, that we might bear this fruit Bear these qualities that honor you. Help us to sow the seeds of righteousness by those who 
make peace. Help us to be peacemakers, Lord. Thank you for Christ. Thank you that he came to die for us who deserved nothing from him, but who gave his life for us. Draw any heart that's here this morning, Father, to know you, to love you, to live for you, trust you for eternity. We're going to give an account. This life is not forever. There's an eternity out ahead. Help us to live with that wisdom.